Ted, would you like to maybe introduce yourself and just give people a little background on the work you're doing? Sure, delighted to. And uh, thanks, thanks for having me. Um, like, like many of the folks here today, I was born with what I like to call the ocean gene, which means that you can't walk past a, a body of water without jumping in or splashing around or doing something. Firm out of that was in South Florida. I grew up uh, going to Venetian Pool and Miami Beach and Key Biscayne in the Florida Keys. So um, very familiar with the area, not that you're all from there, but love that space. Um, did a lot of ocean things until um, after college, uh, they had a little bit of a turn and went into finance for 30 years. And now Investable Oceans is those two things coming together, oceans and finance. And it started with people asking me uh, for introductions. Do you know someone who might want to fund this or that? Um, so I spent a lot of time introducing people. And uh, two things occurred to me. One is that um, there are indeed investable at market um, opportunities across the spectrum of the ocean economy, in fact, the, the blue economy. Uh, but secondly, there's very disparate. And like, like the blue economy itself, there's a lot of different pieces and pockets to it. So the idea was to pull it all together on one place, on a platform where you could see the investments, whether they're for credit investors or open more broadly to others, but also surround that with research um, and other kinds of learnings. And the basic idea is that philanthropy and governments and NGOs are all fantastically important in terms of the ocean solutions and opportunities we're talking about. But you also can unlock a whole nother pool of capital if you really focus on things that people perceive to be at market going in, meaning they're not expecting a, um, a, a, a diminution of return in their investment profile. So that's the idea behind what we're doing. Very cool. And you know, I'll just say from the other side perspective of you know people who are trying to get into the platform, right? It's just, I think, important to democratize the opportunity and make these things, I think, a little more demystified, if you will, right? And just really appreciate the work that you're doing there, Ted, and, and excited to dive into that further today. And, you know, I'm, it looks like Silvio is running a little behind. So what we'll do is we'll get started and I'll, and I'll have him up in when, when he does get here, but I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So with that, again, guys, just to let you know how we, how we run things. We're going to have our about 30 to 40 minutes of pre-written questions. And then at the end, we'll have our Q&A. So with that, Ted, the first question I had for you really just starts with the basics, right? What is, or how is your organization, you know, driving this investment into the ocean space? And, you know, what are kind of some of these emerging uh, just vehicles for this? Yeah, well, it's, what's interesting is that, as I, as I said before, the, um, the whole blue economy is extraordinarily diverse. Um, and it's, finance different ways. So if you think about energy versus plastic versus fish versus tech, um, all these are, they're funded different ways. So offshore energy is a land of gigantic companies like Equinor and Orsted and folks like that. But there's a whole community that goes along with tech and support um, that also is a part of that uh, aspect of it. Then you have fisheries and aquaculture, which you have some places, you have a lot of companies like Japan or Norway, um, but you also have all these artisanal fisheries all around the world. So it's a very, very fragmented uh, landscape. Um, and one of the challenges for all of us collectively is to find the, the common threads. Ultimately, you do have to focus and think about how to connect people who have interests. Because one thing we found is the people who care about seaweed aren't necessarily the people who care about fisheries, aren't necessarily the people, people who care about fort, excuse me, about ports. So finding the common threads there, but also finding ways to specialize um, is I think one of the big opportunities in the same time a challenge for us. And I think the other side too, I mean, I, I love to you know use the term silos, right? You know, everything is both siloed efforts, but it's also an interdependent system, right? One needs the, one needs the other, right? We can't, I mean, Seaspiracy, I don't like to bring up too much, but they, they did, you know, definitely attack aquaculture in that film. And the point is aquaculture isn't meant to exist alone, right? Nature didn't design fish just to exist on their own. Right, we need to have systems like seaweeds and 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 shellfish to actually filter that water and have these concurrent solutions together. So, you know, I think it's really important that we build this interdisciplinarity, and and it's wonderful to see investment driving that as a platform as well. So, great point there. Uh, I want to move on to our next question, which is really, what does the investor landscape for ocean solutions currently look like, and why should prospective investors be considering the ocean innovation space? Yeah, well, to start with um, the why consider it, there are a couple of strong things going on now. One is, as we all know, the, 
the um, focus on climate change now and across all investing, whether it's ETFs or equities or bonds is huge. You can't turn on the television for more than five minutes without seeing something about ESG or impact investing. Glad to double back and talk some more about some of those uh, terms. But at the same time, you have climate getting this enormous focus. There's also a growing awareness that when it comes to oceans and climate, you can't fix one without fixing the other. And you've heard the, the memes about the 71% the of the planet or the every, every other breath we take, all these things that are raising the consciousness of saying that they're really inextricably linked. So in a sense, um, people are getting their heads more around the idea that oceans aren't sort of a, a side thing that are nice to do. It's actually core and central to what's going on. Uh, at the same time that you have that awareness and realization, uh, you have a powerful set of factors that are coming together. So the UN has its decade of ocean science. You have this innovation network around the world of literally hundreds now of incubators and accelerators and hubs and clusters and contests that are all bringing together this activity and accelerating it. So you have a whole ecosystem that's growing up. So at the same time, you have this awareness that it's a part of climate. You have all these underpinnings coming into place. They're really building infrastructure and capacity to have a sustained effort around ocean investing. And, and I think it's interesting too, just to mention that as we kind of see, and, and I, I just spoke to like a climate tech investor today, right? Like we see more and more investors coming into the space, right? I think there's this understanding that, you know, we're not this siloed, you know, as you said, kind of nice to have, right? It's, it's all interconnected. And so as we look to, you know, for me, one of the things I'm excited about is, is learning about carbon credits, right? Plastic credits and these evolving, I think, mechanisms that are hopefully going to create more of this financial momentum and, and incentive really, right? To drive the development of these solutions. I, I think, you know, on one hand, just like fisheries have subsidies, right? We should hopefully be able to subsidize solutions that are actually doing good for the planet, right? So these are kind of some of the ways that I'm, I'm also really excited to see you guys facilitating that work and more importantly, just hopefully bringing more people into the space that actually share that view of that opportunity. I also want to mention just real quick uh, for everybody that you can put your questions in the chat for the Q&A. I meant to mention that earlier, so feel free to post them there. I see Philip's already got one. Um, next question I have for you, Ted, is what areas of ocean solutions are you seeing investors most excited about? Are there gaps or opportunities that are, are not being filled? So two that I would point to are um, seaweed and, and plastics. And it's interesting to think about you know, why is that happening? I think, again, I think it's, it's, a, it's a combination of a number of forces coming together. So um, they're both ubiquitous. They both lend themselves to storytelling um, that you can imagine why it is that you have to um, you know, do something about them. So plastics, as an example, if you look five years ago, you wouldn't find much on ocean plastics at all. But then a number of the really big foundations like the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, Pew Charitable Trust, WCS, they all decided pretty much at the same time that let's do something about plastics. So you've had an enormous amount of work come through that sort of undergirded that idea. At the, at the same time, you had influencers get involved. Now you have the lonely whales and the United Nations and people looking for spokespeople to raise awareness broadly. Um, and at the same time, you have innovation going on. So it's a something that people have been struggling with for a while is it's just very cheap to make new plastic, virgin plastic. So how are you going to get your arms uh, around that? And as, as Daniel, you pointed out in your, in your paper that there are, there are a lot of different ways to do it. You can do recycling uh, elements, and that could be like plastic bank that basically combined um, the idea of, of collecting plastic with some of the ideas of microfinance, um, or you can get people who are trying to cut the, the, the chain short and create new kinds of plastic substitutes, or you have people who are taking plastic and trying to decompose it in a way that allows you to do higher value materials. So this innovation element together with the increased education broadly, uh, all these things coming together are, are a powerful combination for plastics. And I think you can find similar things in seaweed. There's a lot of research being done. Um, there's a lot, there's anything from food to plastic to biopharma, all these different elements of seaweed make for compelling storytelling with more people telling the stories. And I think that's a big part of why um, those two areas are getting a lot of focus right now. 
Yeah, I mean, honestly, I say I'm a marine roboticist, but the tech I'm most excited about is seaweed. <laughs> I mean, it's I think people are, are just waking up to the to the reality that you know we can actually reverse climate change and not just try to you know, mitigate it through sustainability, but actually find ways to really sequester carbon, right, and and really reverse a lot of the emissions that are happening in seaweed. I know can also be used in livestock feed for methane reduction, as well as of course absorbing the carbon dioxide itself as well. Uh, you know, it's just, I think, you know, as far as the scalable piece of it as what in from comparing to trees, especially uh, the fact that it can absorb four to eight times, I think, as much carbon as trees. It's just such a opportunity waiting to happen. And, you know, here in South Florida, one of the key things we're dealing with is seagrass loss. Um, they've had manatees literally dying of starvation, not to mention the red tides, but because we've dredged so much of the seagrass beds and, you know, literally they're pumping the bay right now or recently with uh with oxygen because the oxygen levels have been depleting so much and i'm like you know what else pumps the bay with oxygen plants so it's it's really this opportunity i think not only to actually you know there's so much momentum of course in in reversing in uh, climate change but beyond that just on local scale levels right rather than getting all wrapped up in the big picture like there's all these small scale impacts as well so I'm right there with you. I think those two are, are obviously top of mind and plastics, I think, especially with straws and all that has received a lot of notoriety, but I'm glad to hear seaweed is, is on your radar as well. I would say one thing in terms of, if you think about the big issues of the ocean, um, clearly plastics is an enormous one, but if you take a step back and think about the ocean's big issues, which are acidification and warming, sea level rise, um, deoxygenation, all those things basically come down to greenhouse gases uh, of one type or another with you know CO2 in the in the lead. And so as people think about investment, it's interesting because um, if you could get a lot of things right on the micro level and miss if you if you don't pay attention to that big one, to your point about whether it's curtailing, reducing uh, over time, clearly that's why so many people are coming out with 2050 net zero goals and things like that. But all those things are just enormous headwinds against the oceans if you don't get those right. So as exciting as a lot of the, the tech pieces are that's going on, I think always keeping an eye on, on the carbon issue. And carbon, of course, is in plastics as well. But even the greenhouse gas issue is just really front and center. Hmm. Yeah. And I mean, we see that happening. I love to say, right, policy driving innovation versus in in innovation driving policy. And you know we're starting to see policy try start to catch up with innovations, but we're we're really starting to drive it ourselves through saying we have these solutions and they're happening with or without your help, right? Um, you know, for us, we're talking with folks like Blue Action Lab in the Bahamas who don't have the policy policy restraints that we have here, so we can just start prototyping and getting these solutions going and not deal with the permitting that you know costs you years and years of time to actually get off the ground. So, uh, you know, all together, I think it's just an incredible opportunity and. Uh, Hopefully we'll see more of that policy catch up with it as well. So the next question I had for you actually kind of tie, ties this together well uh, as well. So it's, what are the other financial mechanisms that investors should consider for getting into the space? And I, I mentioned earlier, carbon credits, plastic credits, um, but curious to, to hear what, what's on your radar. Yeah, I think, look, all of those are getting heavily researched and carbon credits specifically have a longer history. Um, it, those are markets that are going to take um, you know, a while to reach their, their maturity. The, the good news is that with all these corporate giants uh, proclaiming that they're going to be um, carbon neutral uh, or significantly reduce their, uh, you know, their output, and at the same time, countries stepping up on their, their commitments you know, internationally, you just know that there's going to be um, demand for these products. So what's happening now, as, as I see it, is there's a, is there's a race to build credibility and scalability in those areas where you can actually uh, have comfort that something's measurable, monitorable, that you can trade it over time. There's an enormous amount of work going in, into that now. I think a lot of that is still you know, evolving as we, as we speak. Yeah, and actually, I mean, even I'm seeing here, obviously, Miami, Miami right now is kind of the crypto center of the universe. And, uh, you know, I've heard someone locally here working on tokenizing carbon credits, right, and actually making them accessible, where it's not just governments trading 
uh, credits, but actually people can buy carbon themselves and help literally offset their own carbon footprint. And honestly, you know, I, I think it's a real investment opportunity because we know carbon prices are only going to go up as the concentrations go up. So, um, you know, I think the, the other side to these mechanisms is just the democratization piece and that, uh, you know, as we build a collective, I know I love to harp on that word, uh, but collective effort towards restoring our planet and, and creating impact investment, there's also going to be these opportunities to find mechanisms that are actually driving the solutions themselves and hopefully giving people financial reward for enabling uh, the mechanistic uh, you know, rewards. And so it's, it's really interesting to see that evolution. And uh, you know, I'm sure, actually, I know another person, uh, Neil Spackman, who's on one of our panels with uh, Regenerative Resources Co., you know, they're working on you know, potential protocols for blue carbon specifically, right? I mean, mangroves are such an opportunity there as well. So I think there's a lot of these emerging mechanisms that, yeah, as, as you mentioned, are, are still, still very much early and in the works. And, you know, I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around NFTs, let alone these, but uh, there, there is definitely uh, this excitement about it that I think can really lead toward hopefully substantial financial impact as well. Yeah. Well, so, let me know when you figure out the NFT thing. Yeah. It's yeah. But just uh, back on that, on the democratization <laughs> point, there is um, most of the things on our site are for and credit investors, but we were trying our best to expand those. So we now have a, um, we have a mutual fund that actually is very good at carbon, very responsible how they do it. And that's sort of, you don't have to be accredited to, to look at that. There's a, a group called New Day uh, Impact that they've got, you can put a hundred bucks, it's like Betterment for um, you know, social issues. And they have six strategies and one of them is Ocean Health. So they're on the site um, and you don't have to be accredited. You can do that for a hundred dollars. Uh, and ultimately, you know, we'll get into some version of, of crowdfunding, but it's different enough from what our core is right now that we're not. But there are a number of, of ocean startups that have raised, you know, important catalytic uh, capital for themselves um, using that. So those ideas of let's try to broaden it and make it so more people can participate, I think, is a really important thing. And we're, we're committed to doing that, as are many others. Well, and speaking of catalytic capital, I guess one of the other pieces that you know neglected to mention on, on my end was there's really also this emerging model of what the businesses coming into this space are doing as well. And you know, Seaworthy, we're, we're, we're a great example of this as a hybrid, right? We're both nonprofit and for-profit hybrid. And the idea is that it takes social impact to empower environmental impact because there's just so many barriers in the ocean space of exclusivity, right? I mean, I've, I've talked about at, you know, especially in the paper I wrote recently, but in, in deep detail of, you know, the systemic barriers of defense and fossil fuels, very much taking and monopolizing the, the, the funding gap that's been left behind by public funding for the ocean space. But beyond that, you know, it's, it's really this notion we need to break down the barriers of what, you know, the box a, a marine science degree gets you, right? And actually saying, you know, you can do innovation and entrepreneurship with a marine science degree. And on the other side, getting engineers and people who may not have marine science exposure into this field as well. And so that is all social impact as far as empowering people to pursue a path that is arguably untraditional for these fields, but more importantly is also an evolving model for what, you know, I think the future of, of as you mentioned, catalytic capital is where we're able to take philanthropic dollars and get a project started, but still create an investable opportunity for people with real impact. So it's definitely this, uh, I think, two, two-pronged approach of, and I've actually already seen in some of the investment uh, folks that we've spoken with that invest, even investment funds and, and groups are starting to wake up to, hey, we also need to offer grants, right? That there is really this emerging model happening for the space to drive the impact. So great point on, on that. And, and I love the, the, the term catalytic capital. It's jogged my brain on that one. I just um, have one other thing about your, your model. I think it's so smart to think about uh, Miami, South Florida, broadly. I see Josh Carter's here from Maritime Blue. The, the idea, the, the, the connection between place and the enterprise is so important. And if you think about some of the incubators and accelerators that have come up more recently, whether it's in uh, Australia or Cape Town, um, they really very much capture the experience of place. And by doing that, it's, it's almost like that CV plastic point that you make it more real and tangible. And if you can organize a community with all its different facets and constituents around you know, that kind of, a, of, a, of an enterprise, I think that makes it so much more powerful because then it's integrated into people's lives and livelihoods. And it makes it a lot 
uh, more tangible for them. And I think those things are really good design elements that you're putting in place with your, with your organization. I think it'll really help you. And it's a great thing for, for South Florida. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it, it helps to have the motivation to be the number one city in the crosshairs of climate change. So uh, hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll be able to get our, our priorities straight on that. We, we definitely have our work cut out for us. Um, I have only one more question for you. It's unfortunate Silvio uh, wasn't able to join us today, but uh, I'm really happy that we've gotten to have a deeper dive into, into some of these other topics as a result. Um, but the last question I'm going to leave you with, and again, open for Q&A after this, guys, so feel free to come up with more questions. Uh, is what advice do you have for people looking to get into starting an ocean startup or considering investing in the space? Yeah, I would say um, accelerate your learning. Hmm. And the, the good news on this is that there are an abundance of ways to do that now. And um, just to point out, because we're very committed to this, just point out how we do it, because it'll give you a sense. We have a calendar that has all the upcoming events of the incubators and accelerators. And these are remarkable programs and Sea Ahead and Ocean Exchange, TMA Blue Tech, Maritime Blue. Um, they, they have these wonderful um, get togethers where you can learn so much and get exposed to companies and the overall broader dynamics. And, and they're, they're open and they're, large, they're almost always uh, free. And it's a great way to, to get some real case study learning going on. And then more broadly, we have almost um, 700 pieces of, of research and articles um, on our site, but you can find them all sorts of places. Even just if you take the WRI, they did a series of blue papers. If you even read the executive summaries of that, um, you would accelerate your learning uh, so much. And then because we realized that not everybody reads or learns the same way, that's why we started adding podcasts and books and films and uh, art, all the things that sort of help you gain a deeper um, understanding. So uh, that's that's my, my thing to be, accelerate your learning and Thankfully, there are a lot of ways to do it broadly all around, not just on our site. Yeah, and, and I think it is this, you know, I kind of come from, I guess, the other side on this one of being skeptical, right? Like not just conforming to what, this is going to sound conspiratorial, but like, you know, what the system has, <laughs> has enabled us to think, right? Like, you know, I look around, I'm you know, wrapping up my master's right here at University of Miami, and I look around and everyone's tunnel vision of public sector academia, right? And it's just, you know, wh why are we just reinforcing, you know, this feedback loop of, of, you know, first off, oversaturated degrees to the amount of jobs available when this is literally a more lucrative and faster paced path to actually developing solutions for greater impact. And so I think it's just really, you know, I'm glad that we're, you know, just even in this conversation, right, raising awareness to, hey, challenge those beliefs, right? But more importantly, there are already resources out there from, you know, every corner of the country now that we can actually start giving people this knowledge to know there's another path. And that's really half the battle. So I uh, love that point and really appreciate all these thoughts, Ted. Um, I'm gonna move on to q and I see we have a couple of questions uh, coming through as well. Uh, Philip, I saw you asked the first question. So happy to have you on mute if you'd like to ask it. If not, I can read it for you, no, but no big deal. You want me to ask the question in person, eh? <laughs> yeah, if you don't mind. Yeah, okay. So, Ted, um, we met at the Sustainable Ocean Summit in Paris two years ago, by the way. And yeah, yeah. Uh, glad, glad that you're up and running with us. So, there still is so much talk and so little action. How do we, you and others, and us, all of us, uh, up the level of activity? It seems. Um, just very distressing that there's uh, the greenwashing and the good intentions, but the money flowing and the activity happening is um, is not not anywhere near what it needs to be, which it, it needs to be 10x or 100x, not 1x or 2x. Any thoughts on that? It's, uh, I, I agree. It's We can use so much... Um so much more on the resources side. I think um, it feels to me like I'm seeing more and more on the venture side, people you know, getting things going and getting them off the ground and launching them and try to get to a minimum viable product. Um, coming out of the universities, there's a great uh, new organization called Ocean Visions, which is a collaboration of Scripps and MIT and Stanford and UCSB, an incredible group of all coming together to get things out of the lab 
into the ocean. So I, I, I feel like I see a lot of activity there. I think one place where we still have a big capital gap is as companies mature and they get beyond that and they start to do further fundraising to operationalize and grow, it's a little trickier because that falls in between a couple of classes of capital availability. So if you're talking about venture, you can have individuals do that, foundations. Um, you have a pretty broad group, even crowdfunding, that can come together, friends and family that can make all that happen. And then if you go up to the institutional side, I mean, institutional investors like to see long track records and big size and things that have been done before, et cetera, et cetera. So they're set up to do a certain thing. And candidly, there aren't a lot of things that meet those standards. Now, there are some funds that are getting to be of size, like the Aqua Sparks and of Netherlands. People like that are starting to get 100 million um, plus funds out there. But to really get the institutions engaged, you've got to get um, you know, larger, larger opportunities to make it fit in their parameters. So in between those, you have this area where companies, I think, really do need help. And that could be when they're, you know, they're raising anywhere from um, a million or two, you know, up to 10 or $20 million. And that's one of the gaps we're really focused on. But, you know, what does that in the end? I just think it's uh, more of everything. I think it's just, it's, it's willpower and it's just keep, keep going uh, with all the work that people are doing. Uh, and also, I think it's important at times to like pick your spots. And if you feel like you're on something that could lead to more, double down on that and keep going on it. Um, because um, there are so many different ways you could go. That's one of our, our questions to ourselves uh, almost every day is focusing on a, the, a few things we really think will get traction because the oceans are diverse and all the problems and issues and opportunities are all diverse as well. So I wish I wish there was a, a clean answer to that, but I think it's just a perseverance and a grit is becoming an overused term now, but I think it fits pretty well. Awesome, great question, Philip. Uh, Joshua, would you like to unmute to ask your question? Joshua D. <laughs> Yeah, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Joshua DeSantago. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer working in aquaculture. I was just wondering uh, what's the general perspective on IMT aquaculture projects take pressure off fisheries, uh, given the rise of the share of food consumed from the ocean that comes from uh, fish farms and stuff around the world. Daniel, you wanna go first? I'm happy to go, but I'd love to hear you go first. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, I think in general, right? I mean, it's, I, I do agree with the premise that Sea Spiracy had on the fact that there's no, just no such thing as sustainable wild caught fish, right? The, the number one stat I love to point out whenever I get my pitch is there's 90% of fish that are exploited, overexploited, or depleted. So sustainability at its core is saying we're okay with sustaining this level of exploitation. It's, it's completely inherently flawed, right? So when we talk about like what's necessary to, to solve this demand, right? It, it has to come from aquaculture, right? It, there's no way that the continued growth of, of, of our population and dwindling of marine populations is going to result in anything other than collapse. So when we talk about how we actually build the system, right? It's, it's gotta have aquaculture is such a key piece, but again, not alone because it needs things like salt, shellfish and seaweed to actually maintain it. Um, but all that being said, you know, I, I just think that, I mean, here in South Florida, we just had the first, I think, salmon aquaculture farm, uh, it's like Atlantic Sapphire, I'm probably butchering their name. Um, but, you know, we're starting to see that emerge here on a local scale. Um, you know, I think that there, again, there is this regenerative perspective that if done right as a system, that these can actually be environmentally positive uh, solutions and not actually harmful, and more importantly, actually enable real sustainable yield. So, you know, I think the outlook is is pretty bright. I do think that the policy to uh, enable it is is not there yet. But, you know, again, this is that whole innovation driving policy piece that I think is going to be really important. Yeah, no, I think that's well put. I'm, I may just add that, you know, back to the um, the, the film, I'm familiar with a number of the, the sort of vignettes and stories in that, although I haven't watched this particular film. But I think the, the basic math is that there are almost 8 billion people and we're heading towards 10 billion people. People like to eat protein and land-based agriculture is just infinitely 
worse from greenhouse gas or emissions or runoff or any way you want to do it from an environmental perspective, not a not a moral judgment. Um, so if you if you take a look at that, you say, um, you know, fish, um, you you haven't attained anywhere near what you can do with aquaculture and the sustainable fisheries part. It's it's a it's a if you're sitting on the, the east coast of the United States, it's one thing to talk about you know, um, you fish and how we, there's no such thing as sustainable fisheries. All around the world, the artisanal fisheries and all the people who rely on fish for food and, and living, it's really hard for me to envision a system that somehow replaces all of that. It it's, it's, goes back centuries or thousands of years and it's really ingrained in cultures and places where it's really deeply rooted. So I do think that the, the basic thing is, it comes down to the map. It's, just over half of what we're doing now is aquaculture. We know the population is getting bigger. We know that there are clearly ways to improve on what we're doing in aquaculture because there's still critics of it. Um, but I don't see um, any way around saying that uh, aquaculture has got to be a pretty big part of our, our food future for security reasons as well. And also I'll come from the other perspective. I stopped eating fish over three years ago. So, you know, the whole moral ethical argument is not why I chose that. But, you know, again, it, it started with sustainability and saying, I know that, you know, what I'm eating, number one, a third of the time, it isn't even actually tuna when I order tuna, for example. But, you know, more importantly, that, again, it starts with, yeah, it, it's both systemic and individual, right? I, I hate to just say it's on us consumers to decide it because that's just enabling everything to continue. But it's really a mix of actually being educated. I, I love to say, you know, we're, at, we're in the information age and we make educated decisions about every every consumption, right? every consumer choice that we make, but food has been arguably the one untouchable thing because it's so ingrained in culture. But more than that, again, I think it's just really, again, on a, on a bigger level, how do we drive systemic change for really shifting where our food sources come from and understanding actually that traceability of saying, I know I got my fish from here and I can actually feel good about it and not shaming people whether they eat it or not, so. Um, yeah, when we get into morals and ethics, that definitely gets uh, murky, but uh, um, all right, I have our next question. Hannah, would you like to unmute to ask your question? Sure, I was so far down the list. Um, <laughs> so, um, can I hear, let me turn on. Actually, I'll keep my video off because my bandwidth's bad, but um, so I'm calling in from California and um, actually, I'm with Abundant Earth Foundation, Daniel's fiscal sponsor, so he can do the nonprofit side and just so proud of all the work he's doing. But uh, we're very interested in seaweed farming, especially here in California to replenish the stocks that were so important to the ecosystem here. But because of public perception, the legislation is very against it. And I'm just wondering, yeah, some advice on using innovation to drive um, legislation and, and how we might maybe be able to do that because otherwise a lot of people are just giving up and not even trying in California, the West Coast here. Yeah. Yeah, I might say we have a few people in the proverbial audience here who also have spent a lot of time on this uh, topic. So I'm happy to share the microphone with um, anyone you know, who, who has spent time on this topic as, as well. Um, but Daniel, do you, want to, do you want to kick us off on that one? I'm happy to chime in again if others want to also. The question was for legislation for, for seaweed? Okay. Yeah, I mean, so again, this is uh, our government. How, how do we convince our government here in California to give us more of a chance with it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say in general, because obviously left California last year, but uh, you know, for the Florida side, uh, which obviously is probably a harder sell, uh, that being said, you know, the way I see it is using capitalism against itself, right? Basically saying we can create these jobs and these solutions in other countries that policies are enabling us to develop these solutions. Again, the, the, the Blue Action Lab is a great example of that in the Bahamas. But more importantly, right, no matter what, these jobs are going to be made, right? These solutions, the demand is there, right? Seaweed as not only a food source, but as an alternative to plastics and carbon credit or carbon sequestration, all that. But at the end of the day, these jobs are happening with or without their support. And I think being able to leverage that and twist government's arms is going to be fun because it's about time that we have some way to actually have a, have an economic upper hand on saying 
we need this and you know allowing if not consumers to decide at least competition and you know capitalism right to really show that this is where the field is going and either you can lag behind which i love to reference the uh blue world perspective by catapult ocean that like maps out the global distributions of startups and the fact that north america combined actually the entire western hemisphere is a third producing a third of the ocean startups at uh, Europe is making. And so, uh, you know, just to stay competitive, right, which theoretically, as capitalists, we should want to, uh, you know, that, that is our, that is the sacrifice, I guess, they're making to die on their hill to keep things status quo. So, uh, throw it back to you, Ted. <laughs> well, I would just say not, not um, to make a political statement at all, but there, just, there are a lot of initiatives that are being put forth currently, whether they're green or blue. Um, and I think those will all be helpful directionally. Um, but it, it's, um, to, to your point, it, it still comes back to there, people have to um, you know, organize around that and really make it um, an important point and get involved in the political process to get things, um, you know, keep things moving. But I do think uh, back to the, some of those larger factors I talked about with climate and, um, and oceans and the interconnectedness, um, I think those things will help. I think they'll make people more receptive to hear the arguments. I also think it will be, um, there will be more people who are inclined to make those arguments. And even further to that, just to use the other side of Florida, um, you know, we've had a ban on bans for plastic here. <laughs> um, I don't know if people have heard about that, but uh, definitely not something that I'm proud of as a Floridian, uh, you know, and, and so we're already seeing almost like this uh, reinforcement of the problem and uh, of, of like, you know, really maintaining that cemented uh, status quo. So uh, if they can be proactive about making sure we aren't making progress, <laughs> hopefully they can also, we can turn it around and be proactive about actually enabling progress. So. Um, with that, um, Robert, are you comfortable to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Um, hi, Ted. This is really interesting. I'm glad seaweed's coming up. Um, I'm with Cascadia <laughs> Seaweed. <laughs> We're up here in Canada. Um, just a, a comment about the last question, government support. Uh, Canadian government, provincial government's very supportive here. Um, the, one of the things we did from the get-go was involve First Nations in our business and coastal communities. Um, so that's a high priority for the Canadian government. Um, I don't know about the US, but just that's just one other thing that, you know, the education part is so important, but also uh, involving communities. Um, my question is around the US, because uh, we're less familiar with what the governments are doing to promote the blue economy. And is there ways for companies to, to get involved with that? Yeah, I, I do think there are, there are some pretty you know large proposals working their way through. Um, even you just take take a step back and and think about you know some of the commitments that are being uh, talked about in recent days with respect to greenhouse gas. Those are all directionally in the same area because if you say you're going to reduce emissions, then you know it makes it more likely that the Department of Energy is going to say, and that's why all our programs are so important. Um, which they are, they're an incredible um, source of funding for, for entrepreneurs. Um, and that makes anyone who's at the state level, you know, thinking about seaweed as an example, um, you know, more inclined to, to go with it. Because once the pronouncements are made, people know they have to go and find the solutions to make it happen with. So I do think as you'll see more, I'm, I'm not very familiar with the precise uh, seaweed um, aspects of what's going through now, but um, I would say that it's pretty clearly directionally aligned with some of the big statements being made. And I just wanna echo kind of some, I think something I mentioned earlier, which is that I think it's local scale driving larger scale, right? And um, it's really, how do we enable local government to drive regional, right? And, and what I just posted in this paper is about how, you know, obviously regional blue tech clusters, right? Are, are really the, the, that scale. Um, but at the end of the day, to get the, the overall scale of solutions we need, right? It needs to go from one local, section to another, to another, to another, where we're actually creating this broader impact. And so, you know, on our local level, this, this is the other paradigm shift that needs to be made. And I, I think I mentioned it a little earlier as well, is this notion of proactivity versus reactivity, right? Basically now, because we had our first major red tide, actually not first one, but definitely a major red tide 
uh, last year that had resulted in a fish kill here in Biscayne Bay. Now the local government's like, oh, hey, look, $20 million to fix this when we could have gotten ahead. Scientists have been lamenting that for years. So, you know, this is really the opportunity now that we're saying, hey, hopefully we can be proactive about it. But even now we're already seeing some of the damage and, and result of our negligence uh, politically. And so I think it's just a really important moment to try to leverage that and say, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of organizations providing awareness, but not a lot that are actually solving the problems. And so driving those solutions is, is really going to be a key piece of it. And there is definitely funding available. And that's what we're seeing as we move forward into that next phase. Yeah. I also add, you know, back to Rob's company for a minute, we're familiar with them, Cascadia. And uh, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, I think a, a brilliant idea to engage indigenous populations and to expand that base. Cause it comes back to that idea of like, how does the whole piece fit together? And is it really uh, in line with the sort of things that are going on in the world? And I think if you were interested in, in seaweed, um, if they found out that there was another social element that was combining with it, you know, back to that broader ESG sustainability, social justice landscape that we're sort of uh, in, in the middle of right now, um, those sorts of, that's an example of innovation, combining those kinds of things together in a, in a business model. Yeah. And, you know, for those who don't know, ESG is environmental, social, and governance. Um, you know, I'll just also add that the regenerative perspective uh, is really, you know, leveraging these indigenous wisdom as well, because at the end of the day, they're the ones who've lived more sustainably than any of us, right? And so there's so much to be, to be leveraged there. And, uh, you know, I know I've been just hearing, you know, of innovations, which are really things that they've been doing for thousands of years that ultimately are resulting in practices that we're going to hopefully scale moving forward to actually start, you know, again, lowering, if not reversing our carbon footprints. So, uh, Greg, would you like to unmute to ask your question? Um, earlier, you mentioned the use of carbon credits and I've been in the energy industry watching carbon credits being used to manipulate um, the public more than to help the public. And mm -hmm. that companies that are creating carbon credits, selling them to companies that want to pretend to be good citizens. Um, how do you think we should go about making this something that really is effective as opposed to what appears to me more of a scam of just trading credits between polluters to not really give the real result of what they're actually trying to get? It's a, it's a great question. It ties into a, a debate that's, to your point, gone on for quite some time. I think, there, to me, there are two different aspects of that. One is the aggregate level and a cap and trade system you know, one way or another does have that limitation of if you really believe in drawdown uh, that we've got to go the other way. Um, you know, you're, you're making it incrementally more expensive for these companies, but you're not really getting at the root cause. You're, you're swapping amongst um, people and you know, it's, it's a tax, but for a lot of these companies, it could be a bearable tax. So that's one thing is the, are we doing enough in the aggregate um, on the micro level, the question is, do these things, um, are they really doing what they say they're doing? And there's been some articles recently talking about whether when someone went to purchase offsets, were those in fact actually creating real value or were they things that were kind of already getting done and people are gonna count them and get credit for them? And I think that's a, a real issue. I, I do think there are serious uh, people focused on trying to you know, get dig beneath that and say, okay, so you're saying you're generating a carbon. Is it really additive? Did you plant something new? Did you make something new happen that wasn't already going to happen? Um, and I, I do think that that's the accreditation process is getting uh, pretty. The, the bar is pretty high. It takes a long time to to get these um, the validation, especially from the, the sort of the the I was about to say blue chip, but the the companies that are that are more well known for it. Um, so I think both of those. Things on the first on the first point of just the aggregate number, yeah, the answer is it's a stopgap and it's better than nothing, but it's it's not the same as drawdown. Um, that's a very fair point, and it just makes us act with all the more urgency. On the second one, I do think there are things to do to tighten up the system, to be more rigorous, to have the press call things out as they see them. And I'm not 
siding with their against any of the recent articles, but um, that that is there is a, a sort of exploratory and investigation investigatory piece of that that I think is very helpful to make sure we're really you know, it's that it's truth in advertising. So very well made point. Yeah, what, I'm just curious, Greg. What are your what are your thoughts on the topic? Do you see ways to improve? Um, not without major regulatory input. Um, just like green energy. Um, I lump carbon credits and green energy in the same thing because mostly it's been a shell game of moving the pieces around to provide more carbon credits or more green energy for the people who want it while taking away carbon credits and taking away green energy from the people who are not, not actually producing the drawdown that you're talking about or causing more green energy to be created. Yeah, I, I that's it for, can I, oh, sorry, go ahead, Daniel, I have one more point. Yeah, no, I was gonna go on a different tangent, so go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> so just one thing that I've been thinking about a lot recently, and I'll just, um, just to throw it out there, when you think about impact, and then you think about this thing called ESG investing, you know, the smaller the company is, and let's think about the oceans, the easier it is to have uh, a tightly focused mission um, for all the kind of startups that you know, they've got, they're either doing tech or they're doing fisheries or doing something around the oceans. Um, but they could, it's also easier for them to say what their goals are. We want to create, you know, this many more of this or that many more of that or this, this much less of this. And that is more, lends itself to impact um, in the way that it's generally used in an easier way. You've got a goal, you want to have a specific impact. It's going to be to do this many things like Daniel, you talk about, you know, uh, 3,000 startups, you can set out goals. The larger the companies get, the more dispersed it gets, and you get more into the reducing things or the equivalent of the, uh, the capping the overall exposure or screening out companies. So there's a real opportunity if you think about this idea as someone really getting at an issue, are they really working on drawdown, or are you just trying to ameliorate what's already happening uh, I think that's something to keep in mind is that's why the small companies, smaller companies are so important because they can have that singular mission and draw capital into that very focused initiative. Uh, oh, go ahead, Greg, sorry. No, I was just agreeing, that's all. Okay, because uh, I, I was going to take a little, a little different point, which, you know, I feel like it gets back to kind of the emergence of it and it's still early um I, i'm almost comparing i almost wanted to compare it to nfts to be honest in a lot of ways because it's just you know i i do see obviously the the potential for it to be in the wrong hands and uh, you know not allow us to actually facilitate the impact that we want and you know be almost like a greenwashing tool or a compensation tool for bad practices but you know the goal is really you know financial accountability and so in my mind, you know, especially as we democratize access to these credits, for example, through crypto, like we'll find ways to actually hopefully give power to the consumers to do something about it. The specifics of which don't, don't, I, I do not have the, the depth of knowledge to know, but in general, that's how capitalism should work. <laughs> so I want to have faith in that. So um, if there's a, Ted, I don't know if you had anything else to add. I was going to jump to our next question, if not. No, go All for right. it. Great um, question. Yeah, Anya, we're going to we're going to change it up. Anya, I saw you had also, you also had a great question. A little different. Yes, thank you so much for organizing this dance. My first time attending. It's wonderful and great to hear from from Ted. So my question is, well, first of all, I have a startup. Uh, we have we are three D printing living seawalls. So hmm. we're using a robotic arm to print on site. Uh, the seawalls, because of the freedom of design that the technology allows, you know, the robot doesn't care if it's a flat panel, if it's a smiley face. We are creating seawalls in the shapes of uh, coral reefs. And mm -hmm. also we have an embedded sensor system to track water quality. And the seawalls will be communicating via 5G. So it's not just tracking water quality in one area, but can actually see the movement of things like oil, microplastics, algaes, anything that's, that's valuable. And then the third part of it is the material innovation. Uh, of what, we're starting with cement, but quickly innovating. And what we already have in the works is using recycled plastic from the ocean to reinforce the concrete 
in lieu of rebar. And that also extends the lifespan of the seawall. It's great. Uh, overall, the whole seawall is great for the uh, water quality and, of course, the marine life, the biodiversity. So it's an exciting project because there's so much impact, but also we have the economics. Because of the 3D printing, we can do it cheaper, faster, and have it you know, be substantially, disruptively, we believe, uh, a better product. So, so my question for you is we're putting together the, um, the advisory board now. And we, this is a company that we want to scale very quickly. We're starting with private projects. The MVP is just the sea cap, for example. 70% of houses in Florida have to raise their seawall. So just doing the cap. But very quickly, we're moving to the full panel that I'm talking about. And then government projects. And then doing global projects with green bonds. So we want to be able to get to these four phases very quickly just to maximize our impact. Because a lot of these big projects are in a pipeline, like a 10-mile seawall. In Miami, which is horrible, uh, in many ways, I, we know we can do better. So I want a really, really strong advisory board, um, five to seven people. I'm just thinking who is the most influential in this area, especially if we're talking about government projects or not maybe specific people, but maybe even like what areas I should be looking in uh, for, for those people to really help us scale. And like you said, to accelerate uh, the, the learning and the growth. Yeah, it's a great question. By the way, very exciting. And you're you're located. Are you based in Miami? Yes, we are. It's, it's an incredible place. It's like the epicenter of this crisis of rising. Okay, so we level. have to link up after this. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, there's obviously. I know there's there's a lot going on, um, both in the private and public. Public meaning the the state and county level down there. And I'm sure Daniel probably knows twenty times as much about this as I do. But it is, it's so on top of mind for, um, you know, people in, in South Florida in particular. So I think you're in the right kind of area. What, what I would say is um, on, the, on the advisory board is you've got a number of different dimensions that you're dealing with. One is the whole financial element. Um, we have a, a series of companies that have developed an interesting product and it's at a certain scale. And now they're thinking how big to go, how fast, but what are all the different elements of of scaling up um, and how do those all you know, fit together? There's financial elements to that, there's operational. To your point, there's tech elements. There are other companies out there doing bio-enhanced concrete and different versions of construction. Um, it sounds like Daniel might be a great resource for you. I'm happy to introduce you to a couple of companies who are operating um, in the space as well. If you haven't been part of some of the incubators and accelerators that are out there, I would, um, highly encourage you to apply to them because um, they can make a big difference. I was on, there's one called Creative Destruction Labs uh, that has nine different uh, areas it focuses on. And I joined the one on Oceans as a, as a guest and they just give remarkable feedback and very helpful thing with all these experts coming in. And then out of that, you'll often pick up advisory board members as well. So, um, so that's that. the single biggest thing I'd say is try to get into one or more of these programs, but also you just as you meet people like whether it's Daniel just now or me, wherever, people are always willing to help you with introductions and say, oh, you know what, this person has thought about that kind of issue, or these two companies might be complementary and maybe there's ways they can work together because it's a big ocean. And, I, and I'll just echo, you know, I mean, I'm actually, I love that question because we're also building our advisory council. Uh, and, you know, for, for us, I think, and I, you know, very much leaned into this collaborative notion of, uh, of, of what it takes to be in this field. And, you know, I just think it's so important to, that it's a very, everyone's here to help and, and that people are out there that are just excited about what you're doing. I mean, just in hearing the brief bit about what you're working on. So, you know, I really just want to say, like, don't be afraid to kind of work for the high places and know that at the end of the day, what you're doing resonates and that you can actually find people that will, will really help with the mission so since i'm bad at chat if, if anybody wants to reach me by the way it's just ted at investable oceans and it looks like we have silvio yes silvio just joined the wilderness of mexico hey guys sorry yeah um you got caught up in nature uh, uh but i uh, i'm all here for it hi greg good to see your good to see your face here um uh, so please don't let me uh, don't let me disturb the flow. I'll I'll circle back with uh, with Daniel 
and uh, and lend all our support to get things going. So thanks just for for being here today, and thank you guys for everything that you do. Well, I was gonna say honestly that Anya just asked our, our last question, so I think Sylvia, maybe it's a good, oh, actually, sorry, go ahead, Ted. Can I just I, want, I saw a couple of questions about uh, ESG investing, and I know that's something that Joe focuses on a lot, Joe Fernandez, but um, and also the question of gender. And we did our, um, we recently did a, um, a joint event with a group called uh, Women Power Our Planet. And they are dedicated to the proposition that women um, can invest in either women-led businesses or responsible businesses that will be better for the climate. So we did a, a two-part um, panel with them. One is we talked about the blue economy. Then we had um, uh, several women CEOs, um, and we and it was really it's really interesting to see the dynamic. I think when you add um, gender to the ocean investing lens, I think it's a very powerful one. So I do think you'll see more attention brought to that, both from the perspective of companies that are more engaged with women, whether it's on the board or leadership um, or other constituents, but also the sensibilities on the investing side. Someone made a comment in there about some of the the sensibilities of, of um, women who invest. And I think those are real things. And I think you're going to see a lot of focus on those in the next couple of years. Yeah, and, and just, I think in general, the diversity, equity, and inclusion piece of this space is so important. Uh, I really honestly uh, think that as we try to just build the talent pool, right, to do this, I already made the case about breaking down all the barriers earlier, right? I mean, it takes all of us. And so there's, there's no room for anything less from the investor side to the people driving these solutions that we need to have every gender on board and, and everything and everything else as far as the spectrum goes. So um, really excited to see that and proofs in the pudding. So I, I was going to have us wrap up, but Sylvia, since you just joined us, uh, I guess just kind of, you want to chime in on, on what we've had going on and uh, absolutely maybe, maybe talk a little about blue bonds as well. So I was hoping to explore that with you today. Yeah, so I mean, we've we've made able to make a lot of progress, Daniel, on on some of the blue economy and blue bond efforts. And I'm here in the Yucatan Peninsula right now, uh, right above the largest river underground river system in the world, and uh, we're learning about um, some of the different obstacles that are being faced here in the Yucatan that very much resonate the same issues and obstacles that we're facing uh, back home in South Florida, where Daniel and I live, uh, with the aquifers, with the mangroves, and a lot of things that are happening and setting up the right investment vehicles for concessionary capital in terms of preservation of land and preservation of mangroves, maybe things like donor advised funds, for-profit funds to go along with the launch of um, uh, and, and venture capital investments that we're working on the Seaworthy Collective with and getting a number of people together. And then larger scale you know, infrastructure projects like, uh, like the water and the sewer systems and the sewage systems uh, that are needed as well as some larger scale, more important projects right now. For example, since the last, I'll call that, uh, Daniel, you, we, and I, we had it as a group on the Blue Economy Club last week. And we've been able to identify four different ports, in, you know, two in California, one in Georgia, one in Florida, to start building a case for a Blue Economy cluster as it relates to um, a, being able to do a Blue Economy cluster around ports and even something like called borderless ports. Um, which I think is quite uh, a quite new concept and have new partners in the team from Rotterdam, the largest port in the world, if not one of the largest ports in the world that are already doing government contracting for that. So, you know, not just blue clusters for like um, coastal towns and, and beach resorts and, and, and coral reef restoration and preservation, but now also looking at blue clusters for things like ports and what a port economy would look like and, and probably a different technology stack. So we're looking at what, what's called a full spectrum capital approach Full spectrum capital approach includes concessionary capital, meaning like grant money, right? Uh, for profit capital, and then leveraging that for profit capital with bonds, like, like you know your your traditional you know green economy, green bonds. But in this case, we're calling them blue bonds because they're very focused and catered towards blue economy, oceans, reefs, and, and water at large. And so here we are making great progress. We're learning from the Mayan community on how we can preserve preserve water. Stop trucking water. Stop, you know, creating, putting bought water into tubes and selling it, and putting it into plastic and selling it and poisoning people all along the way while we're doing so. But instead, using traditions that have been around for thousands and thousands of years for us to be able to preserve our water and and, and consume our water in a way that's a little bit more affordable. And how um, uh, and how we can issue, you can use these different 
you know, nonprofit, for profit, equity and debt vehicles to make this stuff happen. So that's a little bit of the updates, uh, Daniel. Definitely uh, good to see some progress there on the enterprise front, as well as uh, as well as even with groups like Miami Dade Water and Sewer, which you know is uh, leading uh, smart utility for water in, in the U.S. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's some of it. Well, I actually think uh, it's, it's great that you can pop in and actually really do a great job of synthesizing a lot of what we've discussed today, uh, especially with uh, the regenerative and inclusive piece. Um, you know, I think in general, you know, for those who don't know, we're working with, with Silvio's group called Logos to launch our, our Blue Economy Fund, which we're really excited about. Uh, we announced with the mayor and actually what I'm going to do uh, before before I jump into to wrapping up. Uh, you know, I'll just say we're, we're really excited to work with, with Silvio. Ted, we're really excited to hopefully get on your platform soon as well. But most importantly, you know, I just want to thank you both for being not only here, but really enabling a lot of the innovation and, and facilitation of these solutions to start happening. So thank you both. And, and thank you for coming today. I'm going to wrap up with a quick, quick presentation, uh, but please everyone join me in thanking our speakers and I, I will share my screen momentarily. Thank you guys. Um, so just to let you know kind of what's been going on on our end, uh, first off, if you all didn't know, the opportunities for Sea Change, which are our applications for our venture studio, are closing up this Friday. So we've had uh, over 100 people apply. So we are going to have an awesome time getting to build uh, ventures this summer for Ocean Impact. Uh, but if you still are interested in applying, you can bring, you can co-create a startup with us or grow your own existing startup or idea. Uh, again, these are the six areas that we're focusing in on. They're all intentionally broad. We're trying to make this as inclusive as possible. Again, you can learn more on the website. But beyond that, uh, as I mentioned, we made some exciting announcements meeting with the mayor last week. If you haven't seen it on our social media, the recording of, the, of our Cafecito talk is up, uh, announcing not only the 100 plus applicants, but our fund with Logos Capital and that we are launching our seed round. So hopefully Ted will be able to leverage uh, Investable Oceans on that as well, because we're really excited to get this out there. And then finally, next week, we're going to have Vita Wade and Dana Karanaki from Smartfin and Fish and Fins, so many fins, um, with us for uh, May, uh, May 5th at 6 p.m. So we hope you'll be able to join us. We'll be talking about their work empowering coastal communities and both innovative ways and social impact ways for doing so. Uh, but again, if you want to reach out to us, there's our con contact information. Again, uh, if you go to our homepage on seaworthycollective.com, you'll be able to apply for the opportunities for sea change. And if you submit the, the interest form on the bottom of our page, you'll be able to get into our Slack group as well. So uh, last but not least, uh, Julie should be posting a bunch of links to all this stuff in the chat. So you don't have to copy this down by hand, uh, but feel free to reach out. If you guys have any questions, you always love to hang back for a minute or two if you have any additional questions, but thank you all so much for coming today. And thanks again, Ted and Sylvia, really had a wonderful conversation. Appreciate your time.